Welcome back to your favorite sales podcast. I'm your host, Ross Rich, and we got a really special guest today. Um, we got the legend, John um, McMahon. You might have heard of him from one of our favorite um, sales books. You might see in my background there oh, on the other side, uh, the qualified sales leader. I think I've given up uh, about 100 plus copies of those to our customers and anyone I can talk to about the topic. So excited to dig in, talk about some sales best practices and not just what to do, but how to get this to your team and translate that strategy to the field. So welcome, John. Appreciate it. Yeah, you joined yeah, us. Thanks, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, before we dive into some of the questions, maybe to, to get to know you, John, um, curious to hear how you made the leap into leadership. You know, obviously you heard your story in the book, top seller. What was that trans transition like from, Hey, I know what it takes to close deals to how do I get my team to follow some of these things that I've learned from years? Um, yeah. So just moving from rep to manager. That yeah. Was- that, that, that first that first leap yeah well it's an interesting story so i'm like uh i like to simplify things so when i got the job as a first line manager i was a uh, i was at hewlett packard before like hp had like computers and stuff right they were selling at that time they actually had computers but they but it was really in its infancy so they yeah. were selling electronic test instruments to electrical engineers and some of these boxes that back then which is like 30 years ago that they could be a hundred thousand dollars back then so without inflation (laughs) without inflation yeah in fact there's sometimes guys would leave them in their company cars and if the car got stolen it was now grand larceny right because they had a hundred thousand dollar box in the back so i got promoted and i and I took over the manager that was in a cubicle. And at that time he had all these file cabinets full of these lo- loose leaf binders yeah. you know, where when he went to seminars and stuff, he, you'd fill up these loose leaf binders and you'd organize them on your shelf. So you knew which one to pick. And then he had two rows like desktop size of file drawers, you know, so they were, they were horizontally oriented, not vertically oriented file cabinets. So I used to play softball at the time. So I went down to shipping and I there was a guy named John Wagner there. And I said, hey, John, grab your guys and grab a bunch of hand trucks and books and come on up to my office. And I, I, he said, I said, you see all this stuff in all the bookshelves and all the stuff in the file cabinets? Throw it all out. <laughs> he said, you really mean you want me to throw it all out? And I said, throw it all out. So, so what was in there? There's like sales plays or what, you know, what sales what... books, files, all that stuff. But, you know, I, I'll get to the point in a minute. So all I wanted to do was that my, my compensation plan said, it was pretty simple. You sell this much, your guys sell this much, you get paid this much. And I thought, well, that's pretty simple. Yeah. I don't need to sit in the office and I don't need to like look through files and shit like that. So get all this stuff out of here. And then at the time they had a inbox and an outbox, like your secretary would put stuff in the inbox and then the outbox would be stuff that she would take every night and, you know, distribute it through the rest of the office or externally. So what I did is after I cleaned all that stuff out, I took the garbage can and stuck it next to the end of the, desk and then I put the in and out box right near the end of the desk and then I show up in the morning go make sales calls with my guys drive back together and then before I would hop in my car to go home I go to the office and I take everything in the inbox and throw it into the garbage can you know and after a couple weeks people were coming by saying John I sent you this document three times and you haven't responded and I would say well why is it important How's it going to help me and my salespeople sell more? Because that's all my compensation plan said. And they couldn't give me good answers. So I started to uncover what was really meaningful and what really wasn't meaningful. Sometimes they'd give me a really good answer and I'd say, okay, I'll be able to get that to you. And then so many people just never showed up at my desk. So I knew that like 70% of it was garbage. A lot of people in these big organizations are just trying to look busy so they're giving you stuff 
So you, you, so they can look good to their manager, but you're not getting anything productive out of it. And neither are your sales reps. So that was my way of simplifying what the job really was. And then just going out on sales calls and helping my sales guys sell more. Well, that's a, a refreshing take on it. I mean, I think a lot of people struggle with that is what I hear from a lot of first time frontline managers is you have twice as much work, but it sounds like you didn't take on that that kind of, you know, managing up work and just made sure that you hit your number and the team hit their number. And, and that was, you know, priority number one. Yeah. Why do I want to look at win loss reports and things like that? I just, and surveys from other people. I just want to throw that in a trash can. That's not going to help me. I know if I don't know as a first line manager, second line manager, why my reps are not hitting their number. I know specifically what the problem is. I don't need to read some win loss report. Got it. Got it. Well, it's definitely a refreshing take and I'm not sure how your boss felt about that, but I guess it doesn't matter if you're hitting your number, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to hear from anyone. Right. Well, it even happened again when Blade Logic got taken over by BMC and I was a CRO at Blade Logic and then they made me the CRO at BMC and they would send me all these documents and call me and I'd never respond. And I got called into the CEO's office and he said, John, like these people are complaining that you never respond. And I told them the same basic story. Like, if you check my comp plan and you made it, this is what it says. My people sell more, I get paid more. I said, well, what do you want from me? You want me to sit in the office and just, you know, look at surveys and win loss reports? That's not what I'm going to do. You get the wrong guy. Totally. So we just went out and made sales calls. Well, let's talk about that part then. Let's talk about the making the sales calls and how you helped your team, uh, you know, close the most revenue possible. Uh, we always try to get really tactical here. So folks listening in, spending, you know, before plugging in for the week or on the weekend, take 15, 20 minutes and actually make their team better. Would love to hear from you. What do you think the top, let's just narrow it down to two or three levers from either a rep or sales manager. What what do you think is the biggest thing that people aren't spending time on that they could be to help their team you know, hit their goals? It, you know, the classic, is it calling higher? Is it that simple? Is it multi-threading? Is it stronger business cases? What do you think those top two or three things where people should really be reorienting their focus to? It's training and development, you know? So... I'm a big sports fan. So if you, if, and I'm a big hockey fan, if you went and watched even like the Boston Bruins, when they warm up, they do the same, same initial skating drills at 30 years old that they did when they were four years old. So there's certain fundamentals that you just need to do without being able to think when you're playing the game. So the first thing you want to do is you want to train your people on all the things that they, they don't have to think about. If they have to think about those things, then when they're in the customer conversation, they're thinking instead of being in the conversation mm. and listening and using their gut to understand what it is I can do with this customer. How can I get my you know, product differentiators built into the... Uh, the de you know the, the the decision criteria right yeah. so the biggest thing is training and development from the manager standpoint it's understanding that all your people are not cookie cutter they're all completely different and anybody that has had kids you know they come from the same husband and wife they live in the same environment the same household and those if you have three kids all three kids are completely different completely mm -hmm. different personalities completely different strengths and weaknesses your job as a leader is to understand what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are and then try to help them develop those weaknesses mm -hmm. and the way in, best way in which to do that is to look at the sales process that you use and think about that as like a sports playbook. And in that sports playbook, people read the playbook, right? So now I have the knowledge of where I'm supposed to be on the ice. Okay, but then when I go ahead and execute and I get on the ice, I may not have the skill set to take a shot from that angle. I may not have the skill set to skate fast enough to the position where the pass is going to be. Yeah. And what a coach, a good coach does is a good coach is intimate with their players, intimate with their strengths and weaknesses, and intimate with the playbook to see that Ross 
is actually in the spot he's supposed to be in at this moment of the play. But when the ball or the puck is passed to him, he's fumbling it. So we have a skill issue, right? Yeah. Now let's go talk to Ross about training him on that skill issue. That's what you really need to do as a manager. It's all about training and development. Why? The, the better trained your people are, the better knowledgeable they are, the, the better chances that they have of winning a deal. Right? Totally. So to replay that, you break it down. I'm hearing kind of two different things. First, the how do you make sure you're actually using your intuition, being a human on the other end? You understand the sales process, which in your case, you know, the example is the playbook. And you have the sales skills, which is the execution. Also, as a leader, you need to be able to understand the unique you know, pros and cons and strengths and weaknesses of each player to know both have an actual understanding of the playbook itself. Are they at the right place already? If they aren't, you know, you can kind of see ahead as a great coach does, you know, typically where they fail and you can kind of be more proactive with that. Yeah. Like a good coach takes them out on, he, he, they have to know the playbook. Then he takes them out on the ice or the, or the basketball court and he has them run that play. And that could be think to think of like a step in the sales process or a stage yeah. in the sales process. And when they're doing it, he's all of a sudden saying, Hey, Ross, what are you doing over there? Where are you supposed to be? Well, I'm supposed to be over here. Then why are you over there? Yeah. You know, you're ruining the play. So that's totally. that's what coaching is, is understanding all that stuff. And what you're trying to do is get them so adept at their job that they don't need you anymore. And I don't think anyone would disagree with anything that you said, but I think looking at in practice, different sales organizations, teams from startups to large companies, this isn't what's happening. Um, I would say in hearing your feedback um, that more of a gap in the sales manager lane than even sellers. I think a lot of people, it's easy to say, oh, sellers now, you know, last 10 years has been easy, all this stuff. And hearing that, I'm like, I think the sales managers and leaders are failing the team. It's their responsibility to make sure that that's the case. Where do you sit in terms of, you know, where you think the gaps are? Is it on the reps that just aren't there skill-wise and don't want to get there? Is it on the frontline leaders further up? I think, you know, if you if we really go back in history, there's been a tremendous amount, an explosion of software companies and tech companies. So when I was running sales at, PTC, you know, the late 90s, which is really, if you think it's only like 23, 24 years ago, um, there was maybe like 60 software companies in the world. Wow. Now there's 60 software companies in a 10 square block area of San Francisco. And yeah. all of those companies, thousands of them need reps and they need managers. Well, where are all these skilled and experienced managers coming from? They're, they're basically put in these jobs prematurely. They've never seen the movie before. They don't have scars on their back. Yeah. You know? And they need to, un and they don't know the fundamentals that they need to teach their people in order for them to be successful. Totally. Yeah, it's a good perspective thinking the six to, I mean, there's 60 seed stage companies a day starting. So um, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so given that's the reality, we complain about it all we want. Given the reality is that, you just shared with us the top two things that you think need to happen for sales teams to be effective. At the same time, there aren't enough of those experts to actually do this. How do you make up for that? Say you're the CEO or CRO of a company and you need to build out your sales team. How do you make up for the fact that maybe it's going to be really hard to get that talent? Do you develop it yourself? Do you hire a force management or trainers to come in? How do you solve this problem? How do you make sure you're able to hit your goals, get that next funding round or you know, get the profitability in this environment. Well, I was just talking to, you know, Brian McCarthy from Rubric, CRO at Rubric. And, you know, if you think about what the job of a CRO is, it's to constantly increase the productivity of the sales force. So what goes into the productivity of sales force? You, if you, if you really at his level, you only have two dials. You only have headcount that the CREO gives you and you only have productivity. So you can't control the headcount. You can ask for more, but it's gonna be limited. So now how do I increase sales? I gotta increase it through increasing the productivity of my sales force. Let's think about what goes into the productivity of the sales force. I, 
there's three el there's three real elements that determine that at the end of any quarter when they count and they say hey what was the average productivity per sales per sales rep across the whole board because you're gonna have some guys that sold two million some that sold zero you know what's the average because the average then allows you to understand whether I can scale this organization based upon they got it's got to get to a certain level where I can scale it profitably yeah. right not just lose money so. There's three elements. The game for a CRO is really three elements. One is ramp time. That's how fast it takes for me to hire a sales rep and get him ramped up until he is productive, right? Mm -hmm. The second piece is the pro pro productivity. Now that I get them up there, how productive are they? And the last piece is the churn. How many of these reps aren't going to make it and they're going to leave? which yeah. is going to cut into my total productivity number. Makes sense, right? Yeah. So if I think about ramp time and I want to play the game, what goes into that? Recruiting. I got to recruit the best people I can recruit. Two, I got to on have amazing onboard training. And three, I got to continue to develop those people by giving them to great leaders. And if I can take a normal ramp time of, let's say, six months and crank it down even to five months, because I'm hiring a hundred people, that's a hundred months that I just saved, right? And then that means those people are going to be more productive. Yeah. So when productivity is all about ongoing training and giving them to the right leaders, and then churn goes back to the fact that did I give them to the right leaders and, yeah. they, and did I hire the right people? And if you can't do those things, I mean, at the end of the day, that's a simple game, but it's really difficult because most companies are too involved in other things that don't really matter. They're not really focused on, I got to hire the best people I can hire. I got to have world-class onboarding, world-class training, ongoing mm -hmm. training, non, and then all the analysis we've talked about by understanding your, your people and being intimate with them. And I got to prevent them from churning. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it all comes down to people, right? Both in terms of the headcount productivity, but also the main lever you have is that leader is the person that's at the top, that's hiring the great managers, that's hiring the great people, that's making sure the ramp times are short to make sure that they intimately know them, to make sure that they're, you know, all of those pieces. Right. Um, I think it comes back to the, the core problem when I'm talking to other founders out there, the hell am I finding my VP of sales? How am I finding this main leader? Because they're, like you said, there aren't enough of them. There aren't enough of those people out there. So I think that's- And then they make the stakes really. because they just basically take somebody that used to be a CRO at one other company and they think, well, they were a CRO at company A, so we can stick them into co company B and it's all cookie cutter. And what you find out is it's not cookie cutter. It's very different. Each, each software company probably has, it's a Venn diagram. There's some things that you naturally are going to do from company A to company B. There's a whole bunch of other things that company B does that's completely outside the scope of what company A does. And you got to look at that Venn diagram. So then you have to build for your company, you have to understand who's my ideal customer profile. Mm -hmm. you know, what's the use cases we sell into? Who's the persona we sell into? Where's that person ranked in the organization? How are they paid? How are they budget? What type of budgets do they have? Okay, because a lot of that, your ideal customer profile, especially in a startup, is going to determine the type of people that you're going to hire. Yeah. Right. So I've seen the movie made the mistake made so many times. They say, well, he did good at A, so he'll do good at B. It's a completely different sales process selling to completely different personas with a way more complex product. Right. So you have to take those things into account before you start to hire your CRO and hire the people that are underneath that. And do you think that matters more, that consistency in terms of the persona, type of sale, technology, all that kind of stuff, or the person? Because we talk a lot about people day, stuff. Especially in the early days, it really it matters more that you get people that can align to those things. Yeah. Because then what happens is after you knock down a couple bowling alleys and the product starts to take off and you're making money because you did a good job in those bowling alleys, then you start to proliferate into a whole bunch of other companies. Yeah. And then it doesn't matter as much. Got it. Got it. Well, it's funny because then the Venn diagram that we're talking about, that's also already very small with the sales leaders that have been there, done that. 
or shrinking it even further for those early stages that they have to have overlap in terms of, you know, deal size, have technical personas, all that kind of stuff, which, yeah, the hardest part is always the people um, and hiring for sure. Well, yeah, like I got taken over by a company. I won't say what it was, but they were selling $10,000 like boxes. And I, my average deal size was 250,000. And I, and, and I had to break into new accounts and it was a call center business. And I had, so I had to talk to the people running the, the switches up front. I had to talk to the people running the database. I had to talk to the customer success people that owned all the people in there and, and own the, the desktops and everything that spoke the language. Yeah. That's a really complex sale to get multiple stakeholders to agree on a common criteria before you're going to go get an average deal size of a, let's say 250,000 or more. Yeah. And that was, that was years ago. That probably, that'd probably be a million right now. So versus this other per- company that took me over was saying, well, you no, know, you just selling, you know, we need to be, have consistency. I say, well, you have 10,000 sales reps selling boxes. I have 55 sales reps that are selling $250,000 deals. You have license agreements with all these companies every, and, and you they just sign them because it's a box. When I do it and I'm touching telecom equipment, databases, call center equipment, people, I mean, the license agreement is like this thick and it's negotiated over maybe 90 days. Yeah. So there's no way I'm just gonna lace down these deals. Yeah, the so transactional it's, sale, very different. It's a, it's a different animal and it requires a different type of salesperson to do that is the main point I'm trying to make. Totally, yeah. And with very few people out there that have the leadership skills alone, it's very hard to both align that to the segment, deal size, et cetera, et cetera. Totally. Yeah. Um, well, to round us out, since I'm, I'm sure you got to jump soon to a bunch of calls today, wanted to hit these last rapid fire questions. We got... Five or six questions for you. We're looking for one word or one sentence answers. Are you ready, John? Yeah, I could take another question before that if you want. Well, maybe we'll we'll round it out at the end of this one. But uh, so one word, one sentence answers. Main reason most teams miss their ARR targets. Poor qualification. Qualification. Okay, maybe we'll come back to that one at the end. Favorite resource related to revenue leadership could be a book, a course, a podcast. Well, that's kind of like a leading. How about the book behind your your uh, right? <laughs> I might say the same thing, John. Uh, qualified sales leader. We'll link that in the notes as well. Number one challenge for revenue leaders in twenty twenty three. I don't really think it's any different. Is it? Are you saying that because you think it's a tough economy? The market today, yeah, the difference yeah. between the last few years. Yeah, and- I think people had a really good... So I lived through three or four of these major ones and it never affected me. And it, in the companies I was with, we still grew 100% a year. So I think if you really, again, going back to the fundamentals, I don't get, as you can tell, even from the story from HP with the garbage can and everything, I don't get lost in a lot of things. I only look at the really big rocks. So do I have the right people? And am I onboarding them the right way? Am I training them the right way? All world-class stuff. You know, am I giving them to the right leaders? Those types of things, those types of fundamentals. Do I have the sales process nailed? Do I have a common vocabulary across my sales force? So when I say champion, everybody knows the right word. If I say economic buyer, they know it. So if you can do those types of things and nail a really good sales process with a qualification methodology that everybody understands, so everybody's on the same page, I don't really understand why why you can't continue to sell even in a bad environment. Well, maybe I'll translate to that to get back to the fundamentals. A lot of people didn't have that down and maybe were successful in spite of themselves for a while. There's no doubt. The only way back to it is, hey, this stuff works. There's yeah. no doubt people were very successful in the last number of years in spite of themselves and they think they knew what they were doing and you know it'll come to roost. Totally. Favorite segment, SMB, mid-market or enterprise? For me, enterprise, because I think that's where your skill set really shows. 
as a seller for sure. You, you can sell down low. A lot of people can sell down low. A lot of people can say mid, sell mid market, and then they get up to the enterprise and they break their pick. Because if you really want to sell 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar deals, that's a different type of person that's mastered the fundamentals. No, they can look in the in the mirror and understand their skill set, understand their weaknesses. They're very intuitive. They're very curious. They're very comfortable, you know, in in front of an executive buyer. Um, and they they don't do the same things that all the other sales reps do. They they're a business partner and mm-hmm. they bring things to the executive teams that they don't know. Yeah, that level of business acumen definitely comes over time. Uh, I see a lot of enterprise sellers that are a few years out of school uh, or even doing 50K deals and it's enterprise now. So yeah. Well, but you also have to qualify when companies tell you what's enterprise because yeah. sometimes there's small, medium, low businesses in enterprise. I say, well, what's define enterprise for me? Oh, that's anybody over a thousand employees. And I'm like, well, what? that's not enterprise. <laughs> totally. Yeah. More mid-market. Um, most important organization in the revenue org, sales, CS, or marketing? That's a rhetorical question. <laughs> you don't want to give it a stab? You think sales. they're all equally important? Sales. Okay, there we go. Um, now, now, with that said, um, in the subscription world, client success is becoming bigger and really important. I think a lot of companies haven't caught on as to how important it is. And what an actual competitive weapon done right could be a real competitive weapon. As you move towards consumption, yeah. now client success becomes absolutely mission critical, right? Because you sold that deal, but these customers can now turn that thing off at a moment's notice and go to another company with no penalty. So client success has a huge effect on, on the revenues of consumption companies. And the upside. So when people ask me, I say, what's the difference? You're talking to them before they sign a contract or after they sign a contract, you know, put in the right um, playbooks. You could be growing those accounts more than those initial lands. So, yeah. And I mean, the people that understand it are actually holding their sales reps and their CS teams, the sales reps also, to meeting those consumption goals. You can't just hit and run anymore. You can't sell a deal and run away. So as because as a sales rep, they have penalty clauses in there if if the uh customer doesn't consume as much as you thought they were going to consume. Yeah. One of them one of the most frequent questions I get, yeah, coming from Stripe is how do they comp you there? Because it doesn't matter if they integrate and sign a million multi-million dollar deal. All that matters is they actually turn it on, right? So people trying to figure that out still. Um so cool. I think that's going to be bigger and bigger in the future. And I think most companies are off guard. Most CEOs don't understand. They look at CS as like a cost center and they need to flip their filter and change their lens that they look through. And I think it could be a real revenue generator. Completely agree. Well, last question before we wrap up here, John, because you mentioned it uh, before and, and a lot of people are talking about this today, qualification, you know, talking about med pick, band, all these things. I see it rolled out at almost every company. Yet, like you said, the sellers don't even know what this stuff means. It becomes more busy work for them. The amount of spreadsheets that I've seen, the amount of fields in Salesforce that I've seen that have nothing to do with the deal itself. I'm curious to hear, just maybe philosophically because we don't have another hour here. How do you think about rolling out something like that that actually moves the deals forward, that actually helps reps sell better deals when you think about qualification uh, and those frameworks? Yeah, well, just going back, I think a lot of companies, like you said, they just use MedPick, you know, like a checklist. But they don't really, the, yeah, fill in the blank. Really, they don't really understand it. They don't understand that it's an overlay to your sales force. I mean, sales process, and it has to fit tightly into your sales force, kind of like the analogy I gave in the book where it's, you know, MedPick is a GPS and your sales process is a Google map. So it tells me mm. how to drive from New- from Wash- from Boston down to New York City, Central Park, 59th Street South. Now, it shows me the ideal route, just which is exactly what 
a sales process should do. It should give you the ideal route. If you follow these steps and these stages, you're going to get to an order as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And we all know that reps love to skip steps. Now, if I'm driving and I decide I got to get gas, go to the bathroom, get a coffee because it's a long ride, and now I need to get back on the highway, well, the GPS system tells Google Maps how to get me back on the highway, right? And that's what a good qualification methodology does. It tells you specifically where you are in the sales process. Mm. It tells you what information you have, what information you don't have that you need in order to get back going on the road and maybe going to the next step in the sales process, right? So you have to understand that, that subtleties and the tightness that those two things need to go together. It can't just be some spreadsheet, you know, on a, on a computer screen. And then it, when you really understand it, you start to understand the idiosyncrasies and the tightness between all the things in MedPick, right? So I could easily say to you now, Ross, how long have you been calling on this account? And you say five months. And I go, have you met the economic buyer? No, we haven't met the economic buyer. I say, Ross, you don't have a champion. No, I have a champion. I have a champion. Oh, really? Tell me about your champion. And what you're doing is you're describing a coach. And I go, see, you're making my point. You don't have a champion because you haven't got to the economic buyer. Can you tell me why they have to buy and why they have to buy from you? And are those elements of why they have to buy from you, those differentiators for our product, are they built in to the decision criteria? You know, and have you built a preliminary cost justification with the economic buy with uh, your champion? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Dude, you don't have a champion. You haven't done most of your homework yet. You want to go do a POC. It makes no sense to do a POC because you haven't locked down the criteria. And you're going to lose because they're not buying what you're selling. Right? So it sounds like, at the end yeah. of the day, your criteria should be your bullseye when you walk into an account. I know that if I could get my five product differentiators into the criteria, which moves into the POC criteria, I'm guaranteed to win. Yeah. But the only way I could do that is I have to have a champion on the other side that can help me control it internally. And that champion needs to understand why this is a big enough problem that I, as a champion, want to take this to the economic buyer. Because I have a reputation inside the organization. I'm not going to mm -hmm. blow it on some sales rep that not, that's not prepared. So that sales rep had to have done all this homework in order to be able to meet the economic buyer. And if they've been calling on them for four months, and they don't have those things, it's no surprise that they might have some nice people that talk to them in the company. Those people might make really nice neighbors, but they're never going to be a champion for you. And that's why you're not getting to the economic buyer. And that's why we should never do the POC because you're going to lose, spend a lot of resources and lose. So I'm only giving you one example of how tightly some of that stuff integrates when you yeah. really understand it. And there's many, many, many more examples. So would it be would it be right to say that the sales process is that playbook, the things that you need to do step by step to get to that order, and the qualification framework or medic or whatever the thing you're using is on top of that is kind of the quality of the execution of that playbook. Yeah, right. And see and how well so you're doing there, of those things. Right, and from there it goes back to our earlier discussion: Are you training those people? They keep screwing up in this one step or stage. It's obvious that they're lacking a knowledge or a skill to get them to the next level. So let's go in and dig in there because they have five deals and all five deals stall right here. Mm -hmm. Let's go in and train them on those not that knowledge and that skill. Now, Ross may do it very good and he might have problems further down the sales process. But Joe has a hard time here. Let's go help him train and develop him on that. Totally. And what I hear today is... They don't look at it so scientifically. Like, no, it always goes back to the product. 
or something. It's always like, it's not how we're doing it. It's, it's the market. It's this other thing. It's yeah. not in our control as sellers. And I think like, it's a lost art. A lot of these things. Yeah. Oh, I hear it all the time too. Like to that point, I hear the guy, somebody wants to tell me about a deal and then they say, yeah, well, we lost to, to um, no decision. Wait a second. You went through the whole process, did a POV and you lost to no decision. I go, you didn't lose to no decision. You lost to they the your your coach didn't have the courage to tell you that you lost. So he tells you that we decided not to buy anything. You'll go away for a couple of weeks and they bought the competition. And you'll yeah. discover that a couple of weeks or a couple of months later. That's what happened. Right. Well, or even if they're not buying something else, or, they're investing in something else, their status quo, they're reinvesting in it. It's, right. Yeah. They could also, maybe they did a, did a no decision, but what it meant is you did not provide a compelling enough you know, reason for them to buy. So again, it came back to the sales rep not doing their right job. Exactly. Exactly. And, well, and this sounds like, oh no, this, you know, this happens. No, it doesn't happen when you have you know, 500 sales reps and they're all selling. And then you have three guys over here that always have the excuses. Something's, we know there's a problem over there. Totally. Yeah. When there's people that are hitting quota um, that can prove that you can do the thing. Yeah. I think that's a good reminder in these, you know, more challenging times, however we're going to put it, that there are ways to win and you got to go back to some of these fundamentals. And that's a good way of wrapping this up is, you know, if, if you're struggling out there, if you're a leader and, you're, and your team is struggling out there, you know, is the playbook really clear? Do you know exactly how to take a customer from initial evaluation to validation to contract signed and onboard? And where are those blockers? And maybe it's not the product. Maybe it's not the market. Maybe you don't have the right champions. Maybe you don't, aren't getting to the economic buyer. Maybe you aren't doing some of the tried and true things in the last hundred plus years to get decisions made at your companies. And it's hard stuff. And not a lot of people know how to do it right now, um, but you got to train up if you want to, you know, compete in the NHL or whatever level you want to compete at. And that's definitely enterprise sales. Right. And so many people say, oh, this, that type of stuff, you know, med pick and stuff, it's old school. And I said, no, it's not. If you like any sports, you walk in, they hand you a playbook. You got to know that playbook cold. Then every day you're on the ice and you have got to execute flawlessly that play. And that's the skill. And they don't. And if you can't, we're going to go get somebody else that can. Yeah. And why is that any different than what we do? There's certain knowledge and skills for every step of that stage and all throughout the process. Well, I think for a while, because you didn't need to. So people convince themselves of, you know, that, that this is no longer the world. The product sells itself. It's so good. You know, we have this technical moat. Uh, but I think people are seeing that that is not the case. Um, and you really need to, um, get back to those basics. So no, this is a helpful actually, reminder. Actually, this, this downturn in the economy is actually good for a lot of people to really take a hard look at themselves, you know, and you can still sell in this environment. The other thing that you have to be concerned about and sell in this environment, because I've been through it so many times is you're not competing just against your competition. You're competing against all the other solutions that yes. are going to be bought at that time. Right. So the CFO is now looking at everything that should be bought and they're trying to make the decision on which ones make the cut. So if you don't do your homework and put together the as is process, the to be process, a cost justification and why they need to buy based upon the pains and how you solve that stuff. And you can't show a really good return on investment. It's not going to make the cut. And it's not going to make the cut because your competition did. Maybe your competition didn't either. It's not going to make the cut because there's so many other things that take priority. I'm so glad you brought this up before we wrap because that rings so true to what I'm seeing at our own company as well as our, you know, anyone else that I'm talking to is the bar to compete with the handful of competitors versus every single other person that wants the attention of now the CFO. We're not talking about your little organization, you're selling to marketing, or maybe you're selling to the CMO. Oh, wow, big budget line item. This is going down to one person and they're comparing you to every single other, not just new line item, but existing line item. So how do you make sure that you're above, you know, that you're not below that cutoff line? That's the bar today. 
And it is completely different. It's a 180 from the market just 12 months ago. Um, so and that's why you need a strong champion to be in that room when the CFO is talking to all the people that here's what we're going to buy. The budget's only so big. We can't make it any bigger. Here's the dollars. What are we going to buy? You need a really good champion in there that can state, here's the cost justification. Here's the pains. Here's the solution. Here's the ramifications it's going to have on revenue, profitability, and risk in our organization. This is why we have to have it. Yeah, they need to be and, more, more passionate and uh, higher than usual. Yeah. And and the number one mistake most salespeople make is they confuse a coach with a champion. So what's the biggest, maybe maybe as we wrap up, what is the difference? Because I hear this all the time, people saying this. What is the main difference between a coach and a champion? The main, so there's a lot of, there's a Venn diagram. So there's some overlaps where the they both want you to win. They both have a vested interest in your product. Um, they both might give you inside information about what's going on. The real difference is that is that the champion has influence inside the organization, and they may even have authority. So let's back up. If you look at an organization chart, in an organization chart, that tells you who has authority. It shows all the managers. They have authority. But they may, some of them may actually have influence over the decision about your product, and others may not. But there's also people that are not in authoritative positions that have influence. They might be subject matter experts. They may be seven layers down from the CEO. But when the CEO steps out of their office at night and says, I got to make a decision on this thing that's on my desk, they're calling seven layers down, right? And that person has influence. And that influence, because of their credibility, because of the way they acted on past purchases for the organization, mm -hmm. they have access to the economic buyer. And they don't want to blow that again on some sales reps that's totally unprepared. So they have to understand that there's a compelling reason for me to join with you hand in hand as a sales rep and now we're, I'm going to actually take you and put my career at risk mm -hmm. by taking you up to that economic buyer. The coach is never going to take you up to the economic buyer. Why? Because they don't have any influence in it the can't. audience. Yeah, it means nothing. So social capital is the word that's coming to mind. If I were to like boil that all down, the biggest difference, does this person have social capital with that final decision maker, that CEO? Yeah. Just and it could be that they don't have, they, that they have authority, but they still don't have influence. I'll give you an example. Early in my career, I was selling a big deal to General Dynamics. And I met with the VP of engineering. He liked what he heard, heard. I want to set up a meeting with my key people so we can make a decision on this. I said, great. When, do you want me to invite anybody? He said, no, I'm doing the inviting. Now, in all those big organizations, they had a Director of CAD, computer-aided design. That's what I was selling, computer-aided design. They had a director, a couple layers down from the VP of engineering. I show up at the meeting. Who's not in the room? The CAD director. Now, every other sales rep goes to the sell to the CAD director because they think that he has influence and authority. He has authority because he has a, a, a position of power with, because of his title. But he has no influence on the way this VP of engineering wants to run his business. Yeah, He's looking for new tools, new things that are ahead of time. The reason he's not listening to the CAD director is the CAD director already has CAD systems for the engineers. He doesn't need to replace those because he goes home at five o'clock at night. If I sell him 500 new CAD licenses for 500 engineers, I create pain for him. I don't take pain away. Now he doesn't go home at five o'clock. He has training issues, has implementation issues. The last thing he wants is yeah. a new CAD system. I got to go to the guy that worries about time to market, engineering costs, engineering productivity, you know, pr profitability. So I go to that person. I talk a different language, never really mention CAD, right? And then who doesn't show up in the meeting? CAD director. Yeah, great reminder. That's my first you big lesson her. on you got to understand how this power chart works, not the org chart, 
the power chart inside this company with 50,000 people, who really runs it? Who's really making the decisions? Yeah, no, it's a great reminder for everyone out there that's going through the motions of looking for titles and not really asking the hard questions. And like you said, you need to have your playbook down pat, you have your skills down pat. So when you're really listening, you can understand where the power, where the authority is, all that kind of stuff, all the human stuff that I feel like, uh, you know, it's kind of taken for granted for a while. Um, but that's those are the people that are still able to hit quota um, when, when times are tough. But this was awesome, John. I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to walk us through some helpful reminders for myself and my team. I'm like thinking about this last deal. I'm like, shit, was that a coach or a champion? Maybe that's why we lost that big deal that was killing me last month. Of course but, you uh, do. Of yeah. Course you do. <laughs> It happens to the best of us, but uh, appreciate you taking the time, John. So the way to be paranoid, yeah, no problem. Just to leave you with this, yeah. the way to be paranoid is just because you think you have a champion or a coach and a competition's in there, who's on their side? And now you ask a question, who's more, more powerful in the organization, their guy or our guy? And guy in a neutral sense, guy, gal. Who's more powerful? So in an internal fight, Who's going to win? For sure. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Well, great having you, John. Good to see you again. You as well.